Uh, we want to show you a video as a means of introduction to our guest today uh, of a group that went as an LU Send Now group uh, to serve in the Los Angeles area when the forest fires happened there last year. Uh, when that happened, we wanted to be able to go and serve. Anytime we see something on television that's affecting our world, we feel like we're, the, we're supposed to be the good Samaritans, right? We're supposed to roll up our sleeves and send out a group. And uh, when we wanted to do that in LA, we had uh, quite a time just trying to find organizations there that would trust us. And we would call and say, hey, we have a group that wants to come, we'll pay our own way. We have resources we want to bring. We have just good laborers who've been trained through LU Send Now to come. And, and honestly, we really had a hard time finding a door that would allow us in until our guest today graciously said, we will host you. And, and, and because of their great impeccable reputation in Los Angeles and throughout the world, immediately things became green-lighted for us to be able to go and serve. But uh, we have past Pastor uh, Matthew Barnett with us today, and I've asked him to share his story of how God began not just the LA Dream Center, but now in multiple locations around the world. He's a best-selling author. He's a pastor who preaches at some of the great churches in the world. All the colleges and, uh, like ours that have uh, convocations and chapels have had him. He was here seven years ago, but it's been a while. So I asked if he would share this story because I really think that there's going to be a parts of him sharing about vision and provision that's going to apply to what God's put in your heart. But let's watch this video and, uh, and then um, uh, about when he hosted us in LA and then Pastor Matt will come. Uh, I do want to recognize that some of those folks have graduated out, but we do have, we all stand up real quick. We're, that's some of the folks that went to the LA trip and we're, we're grateful for you guys going. Thanks for, thanks for being the hands and feet of Jesus. Love all you send now. Let's watch this video and then Pat Pastor Matt will come up. Roughly 116,000 acres now burned. Los Angeles is famed 405 freeway, a fiery hellscape. In Ventura County, the massive Thomas fire showing no signs of slowing. In October of 2017, California experienced one of the most devastating wildfires of its history. As a result, LU Send Now responded as we always do. We reached out to see how we could serve those who were affected by the wildfires in California. Unfortunately, as we were reaching out, we found out that through government regulations, we weren't able to partner with NGOs and nonprofits who weren't already based in California. Unfortunately, that limited how we could respond as we normally do. What we did find out, though, is we could come alongside and partner an organization called the Dream Center, which is located in Los Angeles. While our students were in LA, they distributed food in underprivileged areas like Skid Row. They shared the gospel at elementary after school programs and did maintenance work on the Dream Center facility, a place for clothing distribution, homeless housing, drug recovery programs, human trafficking recovery programs, and much more. The most impactful part of the trip for me was seeing just how many homeless people there are living in LA. I had no idea that there was such a large number and for me, the, the coolest part was just that it's so easy to help them. Some things we did was just simple as handing out water or food to them, and it was just really easy to start a conversation with them, and once you hand them that food, you can ask them if they've ever been to church or if you're able to be able to pray for them, and it's just a really simple way to talk to them and get them to open up to you and just be able to share the love of God with them and hopefully not only meet a physical need they have, but potentially a spiritual need and for them to pray. It's just really simple. Oh, thank you so much. I, I, I have to tell you this, since the moment I got off the plane yesterday, I've, I've never felt so loved. It's like embarrassing how loved I felt. Um, when, when I got here and the way the students greeted me, it's, you go to a place and you think to yourself, man, I'm really going to bless people, I'm really going to encourage people, and you feel, really feel like you're going to help people. And oftentimes when you, well, often, very rarely, you go to a place where they actually do way more for you than you could ever do for them. And Pastor David, that's the way I feel about my experience here for a few hours. I'm overwhelmed. I'm in awe. And I'm so grateful for all of you that have just encouraged me. I feel like God sent me here to encourage you, but God's doing something in my life right now. As you guys were worshiping, something was happening in my spirit. So thank you for being who you are that motivates way more than anybody can motivate you. I want you to know that I love you and I appreciate you. Anyone from Los Angeles here? 
Wow. All right. All right. I apologize in advance. All right. For myself here. But Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. The title of my message this morning is Standing on the Right Side of the Dream. Standing on the right side of the dream. I'm going to talk to you about how this simple verse changed my life. It's only uh, 12 words, basically. The, uh, the part of the scripture of 12 words changed my life, and that, that will be in verse 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Here it is, right here. You ready? Here's a sermon. In all your ways acknowledge Him, six words, and He shall direct thy path. Draw a line, and He shall direct thy path. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. And he shall direct thy path. I'm going to speak on standing on the right side of God's dream. Father, I pray as I deliver this message that you would just minister hope in life. Take me out of myself into another self that is greater than myself. And I just pray that you allow me to be what you want me to be, Lord, for those here that have taken such a leap of faith. I'm just overwhelmed by the leap of faith that it took for them to pack up everything and come here, Lord, and and to give their life, and that's an act of faith, just like the act of faith I'm speaking about today. Encourage them and bless them for it. In Jesus' name, amen. At the age of 20, I came into the inner city of Los Angeles to pastor a church after the LA riots, after the earthquakes, after the rebuilding of the city, and I was only supposed to be there for three months. I was 20 years of age, and my dad, Tommy Barnett, had a building in downtown um, Los Angeles that they were wanting him to take over to pastor a church. And uh, so he was all excited about coming to L.A. and building a church, you know, and planting a church. And he was so pumped up about it. He said, man, we're going to go to the inner city of L.A. and we're going to do all these great things. And he invited ten pastors to take over the church and see if one of them would want a pastor in the inner city of L.A. And these guys uh, drove around the building and they saw a bunch of gang members trying to break in the back door. And every single one of them said, I don't feel led of the Holy Spirit to come and pastor the church. And I was in the back seat of the van uh, driving around with my dad, and, uh, and I just remember at youth camp at 16, God called me to the city of L.A. to pastor. But I never told my dad because I didn't want to manipulate the call of God. If it would happen, it would just happen. And so finally, after being turned down 10 times, my, dad's, my dad couldn't find a real pastor, so he asked me to come and pastor the church for three months. I was only supposed to be in L.A. for three months. I've been there for 24 years. We're still looking for the real pastor. I want you to know that. Maybe, maybe they're here in this building. Maybe that's why I came to Liberty, to find the real pastor. And, uh, and so I was out of my league. You know, you hear all these young pastors going to cities now, and their churches are blowing up to like 2,000 in like the first year. My church went from 18 down to 2 in the first six months. I mean, we were having a revival in reverse, and uh, I, I was so discouraged, and one night I went to my apartment in downtown L.A., and not one person showed up to my church building, not even one. And I went home, and I cried on my pillow. I said, God, I'm a failure. My grandfather was a mega church pastor. My father was one of the first to ever pastor 10,000, and now I can't get one person into my church. And I cried on my pillow in downtown L.A. for about three hours, and then God spoke a word to me. He said, I want you to stop your crying. I want you to get up, and I want you to go to Echo Park. Now, for God to tell you to go to Echo Park in the middle of the night in the 1990s was a bold word. I mean, there have been dead bodies found in the bottom of the lake, and there was rival gangs that was taking place heavily during that time, and we had MS-13 coming through our neighborhood all the time. I thought God was mad at me for being a big old baby and was just going to finish me off in a drive-by shooting and give somebody there who really could do the job, you know? And I had nothing left. I had no church. I had no one coming to my building. And I walked around the city of L.A. through Skid Row, Los Angeles. I walked through neighborhoods. I had nothing left but a prayer walk. And I realized something, that God doesn't destroy people in rock bottom. He recreates people in rock bottom. And God began to show me something. He said, I, I want you to die to your dream of being a success. I want you to go home. I want you to rip up your 10-year plans of what you think the ministry owes you because of how you were raised. I want you to rip up your five-year goals of getting to 200 people in the, in the first few years. I want you to die to the dream of being a success, and I want you to build the dream of that homeless man living in the park that has nowhere to go. I want you to build the dream of those boys up against police cars being arrested, and I want you to be there for them and love them and serve them and give your life to them. And that night, I died to my dream of being a success, and I started living to a dream that was bigger, and that was to be a blessing. And God said, whatever I put in your hand, I want you to use it for my glory. 
I had nothing. I said, how God, what can I give you? I have nothing left. I have no church building left. I have uh, no congregation basically left. I mean, I have nothing left really, but just a little old area. And, uh, and God said, I want you to move your desk outside of the building onto the sidewalk. That's your first ministry. So I took my desk and my phone on the sidewalk and all the mamas in the neighborhood would walk their kids to school every day. And they would walk by and I'd be like, hola, como estas? And they'd be like, hola, bueno, which means whitey in Spanish. And uh, three weeks later, they'd go, they would come by and I would give food bags away, like three food bags a week. That's where it started. A jar of candy. And then, then they would be like, hola, huerito, which means little whitey in Spanish. And, uh, and so I was out there, you know, playing kickball with the kids. And, and, and that's all I had was, was, was a desk, a phone. People would call my church and I'd answer the phone. And I would say, hello, LA Dream Center, may I help you? I mean, I was a janitor. I was a receptionist. I was a pastor. I was a youth pastor. I was everything. And they said, uh, do you guys have a women's ministry in your church? I said, hold on. And I, uh, I paused and I reconnected and I changed my voice and made it sound like I was a woman. Amen. And like we had a women's ministry. How many here know when God gives you a dream, sometimes you got to act like you're there even though you're not there yet, you know? And, uh, and that's where the bit, and I was just changing. Our church was as big as I can change my voice. It was incredible. And, uh, and then our second ministry, um, some gang members came up and said, Pastor, are we going to use that dirt lot? Uh, we want to turn it into a weight pile. So I went to Kmart and bought those cheap weights made of concrete. That if you drop them, you know, 10 pounds became 9.7, and uh, these guys would come out, and after work, I'd be lifting weights to these gang members in, in, in the old dirt lot, and then we bought a basketball hoop. And he, what was happening is I learned that serving is not a destination. Serving is not when you get something, then you'll be happy. It's not when I have this building, then I will be fulfilled. Serving is loving whatever you have in your hand and using it for God's glory, and learning to celebrate what you have to use for God, and realizing that it is the best thing in the world, whatever you have. And then there's another house that opened up in the neighborhood. A lady gave it to us, and she said, Pastor, I want to donate this house to the Dream Center, and I want to give it to you. And, and, uh, and so we got a house, and I didn't know what to do with it. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to open a drug and alcohol rehab program out of the house. I said, we don't have a pastor. He said, you're the pastor. I said, God, I've never used drugs in my life. How can I relate to people when I've never used drugs before? And God said, I didn't call you to L.A. to be relevant. I've called you to L.A. to be revolutionary. So don't worry about being relevant. Be revolutionary. So I took these two guys into my, in my place, and they were living with me. And I said, welcome to my rehab program. They said, what's the program? I said, I don't know. Just read your Bible and go to church. That's all I had back then. But... Right? Don't, don't let the perfect idea get in the way of getting started, right? And so we took in our second home and third home. Before long, we had 14 homes of the neighborhood that were filled with people whose lives were being transformed for the glory of God. 14 uh, uh, homes. And then the church began to grow, and 70% of my staff were graduates of our drug and alcohol rehab program. I mean, our church, we got ex-drug addicts, we got ex-murderers, we got ex-dealers, and that's just a pastoral staff. That's not including everybody else we have going on in the church, you know, and... How many of you know you got an outreach church? When your ushers wear ankle bracelet monitors, then you know you got an outreach church. I mean, you know you got an outreach church when the preacher says, can I get a witness? And everyone in the crowd ducks because they're afraid the cops might find them. Then you know you got an outreach church. And that was the road I was on, and, uh, and, 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 and it, was a, it was a strange road. It was unfamiliar. It was a dream that came from brokenness, not from success. It didn't come from showing up and preaching the city revival. As a matter of fact, it came from losing year after year. And a prayer wall, God began to show me that I didn't have to be anything special. I didn't have to be a great a generational leader of a pastor's son. All I had to do is not to be a great pastor, is to be a city janitor, to walk through the streets of L.A., pick up broken pieces, and tell people they can dream again. And that block was filled with all these lives are being changed. One day I'm driving down the Hollywood freeway and I'm praying. I said, God, I need a brand new building. Lord, give me a new building. And as I'm literally praying, I look up to the right and I see the biggest hospital I'd ever seen in my life, west of the Mississippi on the Hollywood freeway. The most coveted land in L.A. is just sitting there. All the famous movies were filmed there. Nightmare on Elm Street was filmed there. Halloween was filmed there. I mean, we had to pray out every demon in hell when we got in there, you know. Because every horror movie was filmed, like The Boiler Room and Freddy Krueger and all these things. And, and, and for eight years, that nobody was using it. So they turned it into a, a movie set where people were just filming movies there. 
And so they ransacked it. Hollywood just destroyed the drug needles in there and everything. And, and I, saw, I saw a sign that said for sale. I pull over to the side and I go into the campus and they're filming a movie there. Brad Pitt and George Clooney were filming a movie there. And I walked right up to Brad Pitt because I'm not intimidated by actors. I'm intimidated by uh, Pastor David, but I'm not intimidated by actors, you know. And, I walked right after Brad Pitt. I said, Brad Pitt, man, how you doing, man? Your movies are awesome. It's great to see you. And he kind of stopped. He looked at me. He's like, who's this young guy just boldly approaching the great Brad Pitt? He's like, well, who, who's this guy talking to me? And, uh, and, and I was just kind of talking to him, and he stopped. And back then, for 10 years, we got free Christian television. We were on TBN for 10 years. They gave us a free charity slot program for 10 years. And so we were able to be on television. So then he stopped. He said, wait a second. He said, I think I know who you are. He said, are you that guy that's on Friday nights on the Dream Center program? Brad Pitt watched our show. No, I'm just messing with you. He didn't say that. I'm just my bad. No, he just, he actually used my head as an ashtray for a cigarette. But that's another story. But uh, I, I walked in and, I, and I, I walked in and I said, I want to buy this building. How much is it? And they said, you got $16 million? I said, no, but I have a dream. They weren't impressed. They kicked me out of the building and wouldn't even allow me at 23 years of age to get a tour of the building. You'll say, what did you do? Well, I found myself a back door where nobody was looking. The security guard wasn't looking. And the Lord literally gave me a literal open door right there. I looked to my left. I looked to my right. And I snuck in the building and gave myself a tour of the building anyways. How many here know when God gives you a dream, sometimes you got to go gangster for Jesus, you know? And I'm just like walking on in there. With one eye on Jesus, one eye on the security guard trying to arrest me. That's why the Bible says, watch and pray. I'm just getting a vision and looking at the same time. And, and as I was walking through that building illegally, well, I got to the top of the 15th. <laughs> Sometimes you got to hustle for Jesus. I'm telling you, folks. I got to the 15th floor, and I looked up over L.A. I looked at downtown. I looked at Hollywood sign right there on top of the building. You could see it. And as I was looking over, God spoke to me and he said, you know, the pimps are working 24 hours a day. The adult film industry, which is preying on runaway girls, they're working 24 hours a day. If they can work 24 hours a day, why not build a church that will be open 24 hours and seven days a week where anyone who had a drug addiction in the middle of the night could be taken care of. If any homeless family needed a place to go, someone would take them in. God spoke to me, said, I want, you to, I want to give you this building, and I want you to build a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week church that will never sleep right here in the neighborhood, and take in every prisoner, give them an option for the prison system. Now today, last month, they sent 40 men into our, our recovery program in prison reform. Instead of 10 years in prison, the judge pounded the gavel and, and told them, you're not going to prison. You're being sentenced into the house of God for one year where their lives can radically be transformed. Amen? And how many here know that's a much better option, the house of God, than any other option? And through a series of miracles, the Catholic Church, we told them our story. We said, look, we don't have $16 million like Paramount to buy the, the facility, but we have a dream. We share the vision. And they cried. And they said, go ahead and make us an offer. I looked at my dad. He looked at me. We didn't expect the meeting to go that good. You know, we were just kind of throwing it out there. And they accepted our offer for $3.9 million. And now today, there are over 700 people that live in the building who are coming off drugs and alcohol, one year of recovery program for free, homeless veterans, male and female home for them, uh, emancipated minors, human trafficking victims, um, all living in the house of God. And can I tell you, that wasn't even my dream on my five-year plan. My five-year plan was dreaming from my mind. It was dreaming from my expectations in ministry. But God began to give me dreams that I did not even know that I had that only brokenness can reveal. And you're here, and I'm telling you, God's getting ready to use you at Liberty University to learn some things so that you might serve your generation for the glory of God. There used to be a day in my life I dreamed of preaching to thousands, and now God's allowed that to happen over 24 years. But, but now it's always still about the one. Whenever I preach, I think about a man that was living under the bridges by the Dream Center for 18 years. Nobody could reach him. He lived under that bridge, and his favorite scripture is, I shall not be moved. Because he was a homeless guy that was famous for not moving. And I'd drive down the 101 freeway, and I'd see this guy, and I, I'd get off the freeway. I tried everything in 18 years to reach him. Gave him money. Sometimes I wouldn't give him money. Sometimes I would offer him to take him somewhere. And I just tried everything. Nothing worked to start a relationship and reach this guy. 
And one day, uh, a youth group came in town, and this uh, girl, this teenage girl from Oklahoma, she came up to me and she said, Pastor, I heard there's a homeless man that's been living under the bridge all these years. I'm going to reach out to him, and I'm going to bring him to the Dream Center. We do 1,500 hot meals every day, and I'm going to bring him to the Dream Center to get a meal. And uh, I didn't really think she could do it, but my dad always taught me in ministry that when somebody, you don't think somebody can do something, you never discourage them. You just look them in the eye if you don't believe them and say, well, brother or sister, Praise the Lord. And she said, uh, I'm going to go get that guy and bring him to the dreams. And I'm like, well, praise the Lord. And so, uh, and so she went down there and said, sir, you're coming to the dream center. He said, no, I'm not. She said, yes, you are. He said, no, I'm not. She said, yes, you are. She grabbed, it's like the Grinch movie. She, like the little girl, the Grinch. She grabbed him by the hand and literally pulled him to the line to get a meal. I looked at her. I said, this is amazing. I haven't been able to reach him. How were you able to reach this guy? She said, well, pastor, my Bible says that we ought to compel people to come into the house of the Lord. And my youth pastor says that the word compel means to physically force them into the house of the Lord. <laughs> Sometimes you got to go gangster for Jesus. I'm like, good enough. It worked. Amen. I don't know if it's perfect doctrine or not. But uh, this guy came in the, uh, the program and... Uh, I was shocked. He was homeless all these years, and, and he, got, he kept getting food. And one day he said he wanted to come into our rehab program. I couldn't believe it. This is an older gentleman. It's an old hospital. We have stairs everywhere. And uh, he, he said, I want to go into your rehab program. I'm like, well, brother, praise the Lord. This guy came into our rehab program after 18 years of living under the bridge. He graduated the rehab program, and not only did he graduate, he, went, he became a member of my staff, and homeless Barry that was living under the bridge is now Pastor Barry, and he preaches 18 times every week into the house of God. 18 times a week. Standing on the right side of the dream and all thy ways acknowledge him simply means whatever God puts in your hand. You use it with joy. You use it with victory. You don't worry about the path. You don't stress over the path. You don't fear over the path. You simply say, God, whatever you put in my hand, I'm going to use it for glory. And that's the sweet spot of the call of God. When you simply say, whatever I have, I'm going to use it all for your glory. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. There's a day in my life where I used to think that I had to live my life with palms up to be happy. But if you live your life with palms up, you can only be happy at Christmas time and your birthday. But there's a way you can be happy 365 days a year. It's called the other's life. And serving your generation for the glory of God. And in 24 years later, we've seen it all. We have seen people show up in our building from police cars that bring prisoners literally in shackles, don't know what to do with them, and they drop them off into the house of God. And uh, we've seen it all. We've seen the miracles of crime dropping 73% in three years and the government trying to figure out why. Because whoever stays the longest will win the battle of influence in a community. You change the atmosphere of a community by outserving and outlasting the liquor stores and the pimps and the peddlers on the street. And we realize that there's a certain kind of power in staying and serving and deciding that you're not going to leave. The first day I came to L.A., I was... Um, 20 years of age, scared of my own shadow. Back then I was so skinny that when I stuck out my tongue, I looked like a zipper. I've prospered since. But, uh, but, but back then it was just like so terrified. I was 20. I didn't really know what to expect. I came to L.A. And the first day I came to L.A., I was supposed to introduce myself as a pastor on a midweek service. But there was a young man that was shot and killed in a drive-by shooting. His body literally laid on the steps of the church. I had to walk around this boy to get to my first church service. And it was as if the enemy right off the bat was saying, this is what it's all about. And this is what you're going to have to deal with. And as I walked around the steps of the church to get to the family, uh, to get to the church, I walked in and they were all gathered around in uh, the church. And I said, I know I'm supposed to preach my first Wednesday night sermon. I'm the new pastor. I'm supposed to preach, but I can't preach. They said, why? I said, I had to walk around a boy that was murdered on the steps of our church. We need to do something about it. And they say, Pastor, well, you're a young man. You don't understand. We, the church people, stick to the ourselves, and the gang members stick to themselves. I said, okay, we have our gang, and they have their gang. I said, but let's just go over there, and let's just see what God might do. Who will go with me? Raise your hand. I got a bunch of people here in this place, Will. Amen. But, uh, but nobody raised their hand, not one. And, uh, and so I got really discouraged, and, uh, and I said, well, what do I do? And I did what most preachers do, and they can't give volunteers. I received an offering. 
when all else fails, receive an offering, right? And uh, they gave me $38, and I put it in my pocket. I went across the street to an apartment attached to a liquor store. I will never forget. I knocked on the door of the apartment next to the liquor store, and the door flung open, and I was staring in the face of the biggest gang member I'd ever seen in my life. He looked down at me, and then I looked up at him, and then I looked up at God and said, God, I've always heard there's a place called heaven. Save me a place. I'm coming home real soon, you know, and... He had so many tattoos on his left bicep that if he flexed it, the Old Testament would come out. And the New Testament over here. He's like, what do you want? I said, I'm just the new pastor, and I got some money, and I want to bless the mother, and I want to give an offering, and I just want to say that we were willing to help. He said, make it quick, Padre. You'll say, did you argue with him? Because you're not a Padre. You're a pastor. nuh -uh. When you're that big, you can call me rabbi, bishop, whatever you want to call me. Just don't kill me, you know. I'm like, Okay. So I walked in, there were $38, I gave it to the mother, and I prayed for her, and she was so sweet. She grabbed me by the face, she said, oh, Wedo, thank you, Wedo, and gave me the money, Padre, we love you, Padre, and I, I, I gave her the money, and I'm walking out the door. And as I'm walking out the door, I'm walking out there quickly, because I want to get out of there, and as I'm going, a hand grabbed me in the arm, and again, spun me around, and I was staring in the face of this gang member. He said, Padre, I want you to do something for me before you leave. I'm like, brother, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll rub your back, I'll rub your feet, I'll buy you a beer, just don't kill me. Don't judge me. If you're in my situation, you have done whatever you had to do to stay alive. Do what you got to do to stay alive. 1 Samuel 123, verse 16. West Coast version. And uh, <laughs> I walked in there, and I said, uh, he said, I want you to stay and pray for the family. I didn't know what to do. I mean, before I came to L.A., I just memorized some, like, general prayers that will get you out of trouble. You know the kind of prayers that are so, like, safe and easy that you can pray them in any situation and get out? That was my prayer. And so I, I gathered around this circle. I began to pray this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, my memorized prayer. We're all joining hands in a circle. I pray that you'll bless this habitation with your glorification. And may your manifestation be here during this presentation. Oh, God of grace and sensation. I'm, like, rhyming. Like... I was like, how am I being Dr. Dre? I've never known that. I have no flow, but suddenly I'm flowing. In the middle of my flow, the Lord says, stop your flow, basically. You will never get this opportunity again. And so in the middle of my flowery uh, prayer, the Lord began to speak to me. He said, once you pray like you really mean it. I said, okay, God. I said, I pray that peace will prevail in this neighborhood after what happened today. And nothing happened, so I prayed a little bolder. I said, God, I pray these young men would realize that they're not as strong as they think they are, and they need Jesus. And right when I said those words, strong as they think they are, my right hand got squeezed next to me tighter, and then my left hand, I said, oh, God, he hates my prayer. I'm going down. <laughs> but if I'm going out, I might as well get my name in the Fox's Book of Martyrs and have it in the Liberty, Liberty Library. Amen? And so I figure if I'm going out, I'm going out in a blaze of glory, right? And so I said, I pray, Lord, they would repent of their sin, and they would get their life right with God. I just start firing away, and I say, if you, want, if you want to be saved, just a suggestion, but if you want to be saved, raise my right hand in the air. Have you ever acted in faith, like with 1% faith, and just kind of threw something out there, and you didn't have hardly any faith, but you had like 1%? And God's like, good enough, I love these people, I'll bless it, you know, and that's kind of what happened right there. God, he didn't need two percent, he just needed one. And, uh, and, I, and I said, if you want to get saved, and then my right hand was being lifted. And I looked around, and the other gang member was raising his hand, and the other one, and the other one, and to my total shock, I led him into the sinner's prayer, and every single one of those guys accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior on the first day of being in L.A., And from that day on, I had the best bodyguards my car never got broken into. <laughs> I'd go across the street to that liquor store to get me a 40-ounce Coke. <laughs> that, that 40, not the other one. Pressure gets to you some. No, no, no. And I walk in there, and the guy would be like, hola, padre. Como estas, padre? I'm like, I'm not the padre, brother. I'm the pastor. He said, no, you're the padre of this neighborhood. And the padre gets all the free food and free drinks that he wants. I said, you say free food, free drinks? He said, yes, I did. I said, bless you, my son, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I'm throwing holy water and everything on the brother. Don't let titles get in the way of free food. 2 Samuel 117, verse 23. And I walked outside, and the other day I saw a picture of a three-on-three -three basketball tournament, the cheap old basketball hoop, the kind you had to put sand in the bottom to keep it up, and we had a 
three-on-three tournament in the neighborhood, and me and two gang members were on a team, and we won because they were good. And, and in the picture, they were posing, man. One had the corona, and they were just doing this right here. And I'm standing there just trying to be tough, you know. I'm like, like, I, like I'm from Eugene, Oregon or something, you know. I'm just like, that's all I got. And all these barriers I had in mind, like you had to understand everything to reach people. You had to uh, be an addict to reach an addict. All these false conceived ideas. The neighborhood was just looking for one thing. Will you stay? Will you love us? Will you build something we can be proud of? Would you have one place in the neighborhood that they can drive by and realize that you're not going to leave us, you're not going to get up and go, that you're not a business or a store or things that are planted in the community that oftentimes make them worse? Will you just stay and fight the battle for us and love on us? And I realize that I will never be able to understand the pain in my neighborhood. I will never be able to understand the hurt and the need. I, I, I have not come from that. But God wasn't looking for that. He was just looking for someone to do the best they could to love their generation and to serve serve it and not having to be relevant, but try the best you can to be relevant. When it's all said and done, God's called us to be revolutionary. And I looked around and seen what God's done and seen the hospital and I just have to shake my head and say it all, it's all God because you can dream from your imagination and accomplish many good things. But when you start dreaming from a place of brokenness, when you say, God, I have nothing left but a prayer walk, whatever you want to do, God will give you dreams that you never knew that you had. He'll give you love for people that you never knew that you had. And he'll do things that un uh, unravel in your heart and show you things that you never knew you were passionate about. And I know that I walk out of here, someone's going to rise up and do a greater work in the Dream Center. There's no doubt about it. The, everything we did, we did backwards. And there'll be people who will learn how to do it better. But one thing I will say is simply as this. Allow God to go through a place of brokenness in your life. A place of brokenness is not a tired place in our soul. It's actually a place of vision. On the other side of brokenness, there's oftentimes dreams that you never knew that you had and a passion that's in you that is ready to be ignited. The 24-7 church is alive and strong now, and to be honest with you, it's, it's, it's the perfect audible in God's plan. It wasn't what I came to L.A. to do, but I realize that with a broken heart, you can accomplish far more than the best ideas that you could ever imagine. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I'm just so grateful today. I'm just so grateful for this amazing crowd that's just been so responsive. And maybe it's just one of those things, Lord, where you just feel like all we have to do is use everything that we get for your glory. All we have to do is be ready, willing, and available. And there's so much pressure when we try to do it on our own, but we just realize it's your plan, your will. Whatever we learn, whatever we grow from, whatever wisdom that we receive, whatever resource you put in our hand, all we're going to do is stand on the right side of the dream and acknowledge you, and we know that you will direct our path. We thank you, Lord, for the vision that's being unlocked today, and I pray, Lord, that they would understand that when it comes to serving, we don't have to serve, we get to serve. And I pray that you would use everyone for your glory and they would be set free by the vision you've given them, Lord. And that is to serve their generation by the will of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much for allowing me to share.